Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Bronze, and you are here with me with our first lesson, lesson number one in our statistics class. So today's video is going to be very basic. We're doing a little introduction. And uh, for those of you at home, you can download the other attachments with this assignment that has this document, these skeleton notes, and fill them in as we go. And that's more or less what we're going to be doing in school today on Friday as well. We have a discussion and fill in the notes. So you guys are going to listen to me. Um, and hopefully it won't be too painful. All right. That said, let's get things rocking and rolling here. And let's start with some real basics. So you're taking a class called statistics. What is statistics? Okay. Okay. Um, you're thinking in terms and the you know the simple answer well it's it's a math class right or it's a math discipline but statistics is a little bit more than that okay so for those you actually um hopefully you've opened up this document in cami on your chromebook and now that you have it we're going to use our menu here on the left side you're going to go to text box you can use this first um, little applicator here at the top, this guy to change the size of your font. I like 16, that's what I'm going with. And you can choose the color of your text as well. And I'm gonna go with, uh, let's do blue for Rocky Point. Okay, so what is statistics? Statistics really is a way of reasoning. Now, you can use that we say a way of reasoning to describe many things. So let's kind of add to it. A way of reasoning and how are we going to reason? Well, we're going to be using tools and mathematical models. So this is going to be our working definition of what is statistics. So a way of reasoning. Think about what reasoning is. Okay, making sense of something. Um, gathering information and maybe making a decision, that sort of thing. So statistics heavily involves that using different types of tools as well as mathematical models. Now, what does statistics do for us? All right. It's great that we have this option. It's great that we have this way of reasoning and we have the ability to do this using tools and mathematical mo models. But what's the point? What does it do? Well, in general, to really get down to it, is it helps us to understand the world. The world is uh, quite a complex place, let's be honest. A lot going on. So statistics allows us to take information and reason our way through things through the use of these tools and models and helps us to draw conclusions and get answers to our questions. And that is essentially what helps us to understand the world. So that's what is statistics as a mathematical discipline. Notice at the top here, statistics has a capital S. But then what are statistics? What are statistics? Lowercase s, more general. Um, well, statistics, these are calculations that we make using data. So when someone says, I have some statistics on this year's Major League Baseball season, they're referring to these statistics, calculations using data. They have numbers such as earned run averages for pitchers and batting averages for batters and fielding percentages and those types of things. They've calculated these numbers using data, and those are the statistics we have. So there's a difference between the word statistics with a capital S, which is our course, our mathematical discipline that we're studying, which helps us understand the world and what are statistics, our lowercase s, and those are calculations that we make using data. Okay, um, Some of the statistics you are more familiar with that you've seen in the past are things like mean, median, and mode. So we just use the word data, right? 
just use the word data right here, to describe statistics. Well, what is or what are data? First of all, I want to get this out of the way. And I know you guys are going to think I'm being very picky here. And yes, I am. So here it is. The word data is actually plural. So is plural for the word datum. So one singular value is datum. More than one is data. So what are data? Well, data are values, right? But we need more than that. So that's a little it's a little too general for us, right? Values. Okay, great. They're values. But what about them? They're values that have something. They're values with context. So they're values, and there's something that comes with the values that put them in perspective, that give them an identity, that almost define them for us. So what do we mean by that? What's an example of that? So if I didn't give you any context, let's say you asked me, hey, Mr. Bronze, how far do you live from Rocky Point High School? And I said, well, I live 15. Now you'd probably be waiting for the rest of my answer. So I don't have a lot of context. I have a value there, right? 15, but 15 what? 15 miles, 15 minutes away by car, 15 blocks, 15 towns. What do I mean by 15? There's no context there. So that number, that value is, is meaningless. So that's one of the most important things we're really going to focus on at first is to be certain that we provide context. Without context, we can't go anywhere. All right. So what is statistics all about? Well, if you think about, think about some of the other classes we offer at, at high school at Rocky Point. What is economics about? Um, some people would say, if we had to describe it one word, they'd say it's about money. Okay. Um, how about psychology? Well, someone might describe psychology talking about what and how we think. All right. Biology is about life. Uh, history is about the past. Okay. And we go right down the line and then we get to statistics. How can we describe what statistics is about in one word? Well, we're going to do our best, and we're going to do it right here. Statistics, and I apologize. My typing skills are a little rusty. Statistics is about variation because data varies. <clears throat> What do you mean by that? Varies. Well, we, we know what the word varies means. It changes. It's different every time. Um, why does data vary? Why isn't data consistent? Well, number one, we don't see everything, right? When we're collecting data. There's a limited amount to what we see. So there's always certain aspects of data that, that we can't see and we can't capture. And then for the things that we do see and we're able to measure, we measure imperfectly, meaning we're in a world of rounding off, okay? You don't hear a lot of people say, hey, how much did you pay for that, uh, that car? I paid $28,000. Well, it probably wasn't $28,000. It might've been 27,862 and 37 cents, okay? So we're a little bit off, we're rounding, we estimate a lot. And that's fine as long as we understand that we're doing that. And data varies. So basically, if, if we talk about these varying values and statistic is about these real values, we can say statistics is about real or about the real imperfect world that we live in because it is imperfect, okay? So let's kind of sum it up here in our second bullet, we talk about what statistics is all about. And we can say statistics helps to understand the world by seeing 
true variation, right? Our, our data varies. And we want to see within that variation, oh, forgot my eye, let's get back there for a second. There we are. And through that variation, what are we looking to do? We're looking to find patterns and relationships. This is really what I think, if we were gonna put statistics in one sentence, this is the sentence I would wanna use. We're trying to understand the world. We're trying to determine things that we don't know. How are we gonna do that? We're gonna gather data, right? We know data varies. But through statistics, through using different formulas and calculations, we're going to see through the variation what looks like a bunch of numbers that are just all over the place. And we're going to find the patterns. We're going to find the relationships. And once we do that, then we can draw conclusions. So that's what it's all about. Okay, now, context. So... We mentioned the word context a little bit earlier. Why do we need context? We sort of alluded to it, and let's um, let's get a little bit more specific with it. So, how do we get context? Well, we can gather context. And that's really what we do. We gather it. We bring it together of our data through organization. and identification. So we have these two words, organization and identification. So <clears throat> we gather the data, then we gather the context with it by organizing, excuse me, these values and identifying what they mean and how they impact what we're doing. Okay. So the second bullet that we're going to talk about right here is really answers the question, why do we need context? Because as we said earlier, we were just talking about one number, You're kind of a, you know, making a, a funny story about how far away I live from Rocky Point High School and the answer is 15. But what if you just had a large group of random numbers with no labels on them? Then you just have a large group of random numbers. I mean, it's, it's meaningless. It doesn't help us with anything. It's a group of numbers. Great. Now what do I do? So you don't know anything about these numbers. We have no context. That's why we need context. So for our second bullet, let's say if we have a large group of random numbers with no labels, and that's key. We're talking about what is the problem without context. This is the problem. We have no labels to our, our numbers. And that means we do not absolutely do not know anything regarding numbers. We have no context. And that is no good. We have no context. Make that bold. That's why we need it, okay? Now, what if instead of a large group of random numbers with no labels, what if we had a large group of numbers that were organized? They were organized in a table and the table had categories and had labels to the rows and the columns. Now we have context. And the context allows us to better understand this large group of what we thought were random numbers and then we begin to see patterns and relationships and we recognize they're really not so random after all. So in our final bullet here, let's say if this large group of numbers were organized in a data table, I'm going to look at a data table in a minute with labels and categories, we now have context. That's the key word. We now have context with the numbers and can better understand them.
Now we can go somewhere with these numbers. Now the data is useful. And that's what we want. We want useful data. Random numbers are not useful. Okay. So this is kind of what I was referring to uh, a moment ago. Take a look at the table on the top of the second page. It's random, right? It's not just numbers. There's looks like names. We've got streets there, but there's no relationship. There's no organization. So therefore, there's no context to the data in that table. We want to know what this actually means. We have to organize it. So now let's compare it to the second table. The second table now takes the five columns and puts headings at the top. We've now labeled each one with a variable, name, ID number, grade, street, and credits. This makes sense, okay? So we have Mary J. She's got an ID number of 21456. She's in 11th grade. She lives on Westchester Drive, and she has accumulated 15 credits. So this might be a table of information for these four particular students from the guidance department. I've made all this up, has no meaning, but that said, the table on the top, no context, absolutely useless to us. The second table, context. It's organized, it's labeled, and now we can go with it. So what kind of information provides context? Okay. So this is the first really big question that we're going to face. If we want context for our numbers, what kind of info has to come with the numbers? All right, and here we go. This is what we refer to as the five W's. The five W's. What are they? They are who, what, where, when, and, and we put in parentheses if possible, because it's not always possible, why. Those are the five W's. And then sometimes how is added as well. And I guess that's okay because uh, even though it's the sixth, how ends in the letter W. It doesn't start with a W, but it's there. If we can get the who, what, where, when, and why, we're in good shape. Now, what we're going to recognize is different W's impact the data differently. Okay, so that's going to be what we begin to look at here. So we're going to talk about the who today as we begin to kind of wind down this first lesson. Okay, now data tables, as we saw above, have rows and columns. Okay, so let's say data tables have rows. Now, what do the rows do? These rows correspond to individual cases. We had four different people, right? Each row was a different person or a different case. So data tables have rows that correspond to individual cases about a who or a which. Not the kind that flies around in a broom. A which meaning if not a person, because we don't always have data about people. We also have data about other things as well, okay? Now, we have these cases, and our example above gave us four cases. We had Mary, Bill, Rob, and Sarah. Now, cases, as we have seen in our table, are referred to by many different names. And I don't mean the names that we saw up in our table. And the names differ depending upon the situation. So what do I mean by this? I'm not talking about the names Mary, Bill, Rob, and Sarah, and I'm actually cracking myself up here. I didn't even realize I wrote it that way. Um, <clears throat> we talk about cases in general, okay? Cases in general. So what do we mean by this? Well. How can we gather information? We can gather information through the use of a survey. And I think many of us have been there. Um, right now we have the national census is going on. That's a survey. 
right? They send out a letter to each household. They ask you to fill it out and send it back in. Um, sometimes you're at the mall. You'll see someone kind of wandering around um, in the different areas there with a clipboard. They approach you and say, hey, we'd like to uh, ask you a few questions for a survey. If you are a person nice enough to stop and answer those questions, you become a respondent. So we say respondents are individuals who answer a survey. So that's one type of case. Okay. A case could be a group or cases may be respondents if they're individuals who are answering questions in a survey. All right. How else can we gather information? How about an experiment? Experiments are done all the time. So experiments are done if they're people, they're done on what we call subjects or participants, people who participate in an experiment. So we have subjects or participants are people on whom we experiments. Right now, we have subjects and participants being experimented on those who have uh, volunteered to be guinea pigs for the COVID vaccine, and they are being experimented on. They're being uh, injected with this experimental vaccine, and then they're, the doctors are monitoring them and checking their blood and their health to see how they react. So those people would be known as subjects or participants. So those are really the two categories for people. But we also said they don't have to be people, right? We've got data. We can get data from animals, right? We might watch um, a group of sheep to see uh, how many hours a day they feed, how many hours a day they hunt or they sleep, or that sort of thing. Uh, we might perform experiments on plants and give them different types of fertilizer, or we might even do experiments on inanimate app subjects. Let's say we come up with, uh, we're a company and we've just come up with a brand new type of tire for cars. Well, we might take a whole group of cars and fit them with these tires and drive them until the tires go bald to see how many miles it takes. We're experimenting on an inanimate subject or object. So if we fall in one of the, if something falls in one of those three categories, animals, plants, or inanimate subjects, we refer to them as experimental units. So we say experimental units are animals, plants, or inanimate objects. And that is our who. Now, Right down here at the bottom of this page, we just want to add one other thing. And I'm going to make this uh, bold and give it some italics. Usually, which is a big word in statistics, we use a lot of words that we call weasel words, or I refer to them as weasel words. So it weasels us out of being boxed into um, a situation where we say, well, this happens all the time because very little happens all the time in statistics. So we see a word like usually come up a lot. So usually the cases are a sample selected from a larger population that we would like to know more about. Right? Isn't that the whole purpose of collecting data? Don't we want to answer some questions? Don't we want to know more about some group? And usually the group is pretty big. We can't ask them all. So we grab ourselves a sample. Okay, So that's a great uh, sentence there. Make sure you get that whole thing down. That's very important. All right. So let's just look at two quick examples, and then that will be that. So here we have in our first example... Consumer Reports Magazine, they, uh, they do a lot of review of products, right? Kind of rank them, uh, talk about their different characteristics and qualities. So let's say that magazine published a review of 162 gaming laptops from a variety of manufacturers. So just with that one sentence alone, 
let's see if we can determine what would be the population of interests. So what is the population you're trying to know more about? Okay. What is the sample that was taken? And for our five W's, let's just see if we can identify who is the who of the study. So why don't you pause the video for a minute, see if you can write down your solutions. I'm gonna pause for a few seconds, let you do that, and then come on back and we'll talk. All right, so hopefully you were able to come up with your three solutions. Let's see what we've got. Let's start with the population of interest. Okay, so the population of interest. I'm big on full sentences here, folks. I think that's a great way to write things. The population of interest is what? Now, we want to be careful. Remember, we have to describe a population. So in this case, the population would be gaming laptops, not the 162. That's not our population. We want to know about all gaming laptops. We just happen to have a sample of 162 of them. So the population of interest is all gaming laptops currently available. So by taking a survey and reviewing 162 of them, we will learn more information about the population of all gaming laptops. Okay, the sample. What is the sample that was used here? Not the, but the. There we are. The sample, the sample was actually this group that was reviewed. So the sample is this particular group of 162, and look how specific my answer is. 162, I'm giving a quantity. Quantity of what? Gaming laptops that were studied. Okay, or if you said that were reviewed, that would be fine as well. This is a complete answer. And one of the things, one of the challenges I always have year after year with um, my statistics classes is the development of full and complete answers using full and complete sentences. Okay, we're really going to have to work on that. Okay, so finally, what is the who? Well, a guy at my age knows the who is a great rock band that started out in the 60s. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of them, but we talk about the who of the study. I don't know if you appreciate my dad jokes, but they're going to still come flying at you. So the who of the study, who is in this study? Well, in this case, remember we said earlier, the who doesn't have to be a person or people. The who in this case is the same as the sample. The who of this study is this particular group of 162 gaming laptops. So the who of the study, I am going to copy and paste. And there we are. So that gives us a population of interest, that gives us our sample, and it gives us the who of the study. All right, last one for today. A little practice problem here. All right, same idea. So here we have a marketing company. You might have heard of them, JD Power and Associates. So they had a study. And they have a study called the Automotive Performance Execution and Layout, called the Appeal Study. And they execute the study to examine what people like about their car's performance and design. So they came up with a report back in 2019 on responses from almost 85,000 people who had purchased or leased new cars. So the population of interest. What are we trying to find out about? And this is tricky. If we were to jump into this question without thinking, you might think we were trying to find out about the people who purchased or leased these new cars. And that's not correct. Think about what the study was done to do. It was done to examine what people like about their car, specifically the car's performance and design. 
So in this case, the pop, pop, elation of interest isn't the car owners, but the population of interest is all new cars. Remember the 85,000, which represents people who purchase or lease new cars, isn't the whole population of cars. That's a sample. I would think in the year 2019, there were probably more than 85,000 purchases and leases on new cars. Okay. What was the sample? Well, I think out of all three questions, to me, that's the this is the most straightforward one. So here, the sample is the 85,000 recently purchased or leased, we want to be complete in our answer, new cars. And finally, the who. And again, sometimes when we see who, we instantly think people. We are not gathering information about the car owners. We're gathering information about their cars. What is it about the car's performance and the design that they like? It's not information about the people. So in this case, again, we find the sample. Oh, look at that. I made a boo-boo. All right. Um, let's see. Do I have a back arrow? I do not see a back arrow. Okay. So that doesn't make me very happy. So let's erase this. See? All make mistakes sooner or later. Let's try this again. The 85,000 recently purchased or leased new cars. All right, we got our answer back. Now let's see if we do this right. We want to leave that right there, and we're going to copy, and we're going to paste. Because our answer is the same. The sample and the who are the same. And we, we seem to find that happens on a pretty regular basis. But do not, please, do not fall into the trap that the sample and the who are always going to be the same. Sometimes they do differ. All right. So that ends our first video lesson. Okay. Lesson number one in our statistics class. Um, you're going to see that there's an assignment I'd like you to complete also over the weekend. And that will be uh, on our Google Classroom as well. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you guys have a great weekend. And we will see you on Monday. Bye-bye.